everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com back again with another edition of Wrestlers of the Week. The penultimate edition of Wrestlers of the Week 2020 because obviously next week is Christmas Day. I'm not working on Christmas. I'll be doing the last episode of Wrestlers of the Week shortly after that. So we will get a final episode, don't worry about that. But as of now, this is the last one for a week and a bit. And it's been a big one as well. Seismic in terms of how tight it is at the top of the league table. A lot of interesting movement in the top 10 as well. Just lots of very interesting wrestling happened this week. So without any further ado, did I even do my intro? I, did I say it's Friday, Friday, gotta get... I'll do it now. It's Friday, Friday, gotta get down on Friday because it's time for my wrestlers of the week. The penultimate edition, blah, 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 blah. That, that'll do, won't it? Honourable mentions. Your honourable mentions this week. Sheamus has been consistently one of the better parts of Monday Night Raw, I reckon, so he deserves recognition for that. Uh, I might have been guilty of ignoring him over the past few weeks, certainly in terms of honourable mentions. So I'm giving him one now. Chris Bay, great main event against Rich Swan uh, for Impact, but he came up short, couldn't quite win the Impact World Championship. Uh, but a big, big, you know, match for him. Main eventing a pay-per-view against the champion, fair play to Chris Bay, bright things in his future for sure. And over in DDT, uh, not as many standout matches as we've seen from DDT in the past few weeks, but Takashita and Harashima had probably the pick of the bunch. Now, on to the top 10. Now, we're doing number 10 and 9 simultaneously because they're a tag team. It's really hard to differentiate between them. I will give one of them one point and one of them two points, which I'll explain at the end of this point. But as for now, it's number 10 and number 9, the Gorillas of Destiny, Tamatonga and Tangaloa. Gorilla Tactics, it's time for warfare. Ain't nobody realer than Gorillas. And they've proven that once again in 2020, winning New Japan's tag team tournament. They are the best tag team in all of the land. They did it by cheating. But that's okay, they're heels, they're members of the Bullet Club. They are Bullet Club OGs, of course, especially Tamatonga. And uh, I think that this tournament was in a very unfortunate position because it was running concurrently with Best of the Super Juniors, which of course stole more headlines. But we need to recognize the Gorillas of Destiny, I think, for winning this tournament. They triumphed over David Finley and Juice Robinson, Finn Juice, lovely babyface tag team, lovely babyface boys, in the final of this year's World Tag League, and won. They beat those babyfaces. We had a sad heel ending, except I'm horrendously biased in favor of the G.O.D., so I was pretty happy. But yes, as I mentioned, they did cheat to win. Jado getting involved, weaponry, you know what it's like being a member of the Bullet Club. Sometimes you gotta do these things to get ahead. And as proven by the image there, it bloody won the damn thing. So congratulations to Tama Tonga and Tanga Loa picking up some points. Um, I'll give Tanga Loa one and Tama Tonga two, I suppose. It's hard, isn't it? Because, you know, when, especially when a, a team cheats to win, you can't say that one of them had more of a standout performance. I think generally I find Tama Tonga's brand of wrestling a little bit more exciting than Tanga Loa's, but, you know, I'm not saying that Tanga Loa's bad or anything. In fact, I'd say he's improved quite a lot over the past few years. But I'm giving Tama Tonga two points. His quickness, his change of direction, his uniqueness in the ring. He really is a wrestler unlike any other in the world today. He's very unique, in fact. So I reckon, I reckon that's a fair way to look at it. Congratulations on both of them. Uh, Tangaloa, one point. Tama Tonga, two points. Which means that we are already up to number eight, a man that I briefly mentioned in the Honourable Mentions when he wrestled Chris Bay in the main event of Impact's latest pay-per-view. And his name, of course, and still the Impact World Champion, is Rich Swan. Now, you, I've seen a few people say that this pay-per-view was a little bit of a letdown. It felt slightly run-of-the-mill. Impact have been getting a lot of praise this year, and rightly so, for handling the pandemic a lot better than many other promotions. In fact, they've been remarkably consistent given the circumstances. But I think this pay-per-view probably wasn't the best thing they put on this year. It was maybe just a little bit underwhelming. On the positive side of things, the main event was really good. And I think Matthew pointed out to me as well that this is one of the only times ever that two African-Americans have main evented uh, a major wrestling pay-per-view in North America. That is crazy. I can't actually believe that is the case. Obviously, this is really good, then it's really progressive, but this should have been different a long time ago, surely. But regardless, Chris Bay and Rich Swan put on a very good match. Rich Swan, of course, coming up with the goods, securing the big victory and securing for himself three lovely points on Wrestlers of the Week. Now, he's got a few interesting weeks ahead, hasn't he? Rich Swan has found himself 
booked in Kenny Omega's first Impact match. Obviously, Omega, but if you've been living under a rock, Omega is the AW champion, but has gone over to Impact, and it's all it's all confusing. The zeitgeist is being broken as we speak. But what that means is that Kenny has made no secret of the fact that he might want to collect a few titles. He's got two major titles at the minute, the AW World Championship and the Triple uh, A Mega Championship as well. He's the Triple A Mega Campeon, of course, if you did GCSE Spanish like myself. And what that means is the Rich Swan's probably in Kenny Omega's firing line. And that means that he might well lose this title to a proper outsider and that would be really bad for him. And in the build up to what I assume is gonna be a champion versus champion match, we've got Kenny Omega's first impact match. It's Omega, Gallows and Anderson, the club of course reunited, taking on Rich Swan and my boys, the Motor City Machine Guns. Now, I really want them to win because I love the Machine Guns uh, and I'll feel bad for Rich Swan if he just gets a title yanked from him at the first time of asking. But this isn't a title match yet. I just feel like it might set up one. Now on to number seven, uh, and a man who I think lost a match this week that I was very certain he would win. It's the Bruiserweight, Pete Dunne. Pete Dunne had the best match on NXT this week. Of course, he's a phenomenal wrestler, but he lost. And I was so, so certain that he was gonna win. Uh, basically, Pete Dunne took on Kyle O'Reilly to become number one contender to Finn Balor's NXT Championship. And yeah, Kyle O'Reilly won. I was so certain that Pete Dunne was going to win. Yes, his team lost the War Games match against the Undisputed Era. You could argue that in kayfabe terms, momentum is in the Undisputed Era's favour. But I really thought, with Kyle O'Reilly having been the last person to challenge for Balor's Championship, it would now be a new face. But instead, we've got the same man challenging again. Interesting stuff. I wasn't too disappointed. I, I think both men are fantastic. I wouldn't have cared particularly which one went forwards to face Finn Balor but I am surprised on behalf of Pete Dunne. Hopefully this isn't too much of a knock to Pete Dunne, and I don't think it will be for reasons I will explain in a short while in this very video. But for now, what I will say is, great match by Pete on NXT. He's such a consistently excellent wrestler. It's hard not to give him points sometimes. He's more than in that this week, in a competitive week too, and I think he fully deserves it. So congratulations, Pete Dunne, but that's a big loss, that. Hopefully he can bounce back. Number six, he's a flipping head, banger, banger, banger. I love dubstep, as you can clearly tell. Number six this week is El Fantasmo, AKA ELP, AKA the back-to-back -back winner of the New Japan Super J Cup. Yes, uh, on social media, Fantasmo was talking a very big game about the idea that he was gonna go back to back. He won last year's Super J Cup. He was talking about the fact that he was gonna definitely win this year's Super J Cup, which I thought was all a ruse. I thought he was gonna lose in the final, but that's not what happened at all. He actually just won it. And ELP did not have an easy route to the final either, taking on Leo Rush in the first round, Blake Christian in the second round, and ACH in the final. Three fantastic high flyers, and you know, El Fantasma is a fantastic high flyer in his own right. But perhaps the, the reason that he won this over a, a field of incredible athletes and sort of flippy cruiserweight types was potentially the fact that he's not just a high flyer. He is a very good heel as well. He's really good at getting people to hate him. So maybe that's why ELP won, just by being one of the cockiest wrestlers in the world today. Maybe taking Adam Cole's crown, now that Cole's a bit of a baby face. Uh, I think that ELP though is a worthy winner. I would have maybe have liked to have seen somebody new win, but we're getting a match out of it down the line at Wrestle Kingdom, down the line, in just a few weeks. Fantasma will take on Hiromu Takahashi in a number one contendership match for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. If they give El Fantasma a chance to shine, this could possibly be the biggest and best performance of his entire career in victory or defeat. So, and he's very much the underdog, but I don't think it matters if he loses. So, I hope he does really well. I'm wishing him luck right now. What I will say is that the Super J Cup, just from the format of it, and obviously the lack of fans and everything, maybe was a bit underwhelming this year. Uh, looking at the field beforehand, I was like, wow, this tournament's gonna be amazing. And the matches were all shorter than maybe they could have been, and, you know, I understand that there were difficulties in setting it up because you can't, you know, you can't have the full benefit of a non-pandemic era wrestling show. But at the same time, it was still decent. And I think that El Fantasma was probably on balance the best performer in the tournament. So I don't feel bad giving many points here at all. And I forgot to mention as well, actually, because obviously Wrestle Kingdom is a two day affair again this year, that that match, ELP versus Takashi, will take place on night one. And then on night two, the winner of that match will face Taiji Ishimori for the belt. So it could be a massive couple of days for El Fantasma. Now on to number five, I've, no, I've already kind of mentioned the match, but the man who beat Pete Dunne on NXT this week, 
and of course a member of the Undisputed Era, a victorious man at War Games, and the last man to challenge the NXT champion, Kyle O'Reilly and he's gonna challenge him again. Now this is a very interesting result to me. I said just before that I didn't really mind which one of them won this match and went on to challenge Balor, but I did say that I don't think Pete Dunne will be too affected by this loss. Now you might be saying why, this was a big chance for him to have a title shot and he didn't take it. Why is this not a big deal? I'll explain why now. Basically, I think Kyle O'Reilly is gonna beat Finn Balor. Uh, I really hope he's gonna beat Finn Balor as well. I would absolutely love it if he did. And then I think that maybe we'll get a title feud between Kyle O'Reilly and Pete Dunne. That would be absolutely brilliant. Maybe there's a touch of fantasy booking going on in my head, but I think that would certainly be the way I would go if I was in charge of NXT Triple H. A great performance once again as well from Kyle O'Reilly. He has perhaps been uh, NXT's performer of 2020. Maybe, maybe up there with Rhea Ripley. Maybe up there with Pat McAfee, I guess, in a way. Or, of course, Adam Cole, who's always near the top of proceedings. Uh, but I think Kyle O'Reilly's had a fantastic year, and especially in the latter half. And I really hope that he does beat Balor and wins that championship. Because for a long time now, O'Reilly, just by being in the Undisputed Era, which are a brilliant stable that I'm a huge fan of, he's been kind of limited in terms of people's exposure to him as a brilliant individual wrestler. Now that he has the chance to do that, I, I think the sky could be the limit for him if he wins that title. I would love it if he beat Balor. I don't know why they've booked the rematch if he's not gonna beat Balor. I don't know what they'd gain from having Balor beat him twice. So, I'm crossing my fingers and really hoping it happens. Next up we have number four, and it's time to talk about Triple Mania, of course, Triple A's biggest show of the year, maybe the biggest show of the year in all of Mexican wrestling on an annual basis. This one had a bit of a weird feel, of course, in a totally empty arena, uh, and obviously Spider-Man was there as well, and, and Thanos, and it, yeah, that was, that was odd. But unquestionably, everybody's match of the night, that I've heard anyway who watched it, was Laredo Kid's title shot against Kenny Omega. That's why number four this week is indeed Laredo Kid. Now, I was, a part of me thought maybe they'll find some sort of way of having Laredo Kid take the title back from Kenny Omega, and then suddenly he, you have to say, he'd be the biggest babyface in AAA. At least to my sort of outsider view of AAA, I know that the way the AAA is set up and a lot of Mexican wrestling, the kind of the big legends are the very top of the card, aren't they? And then, you know, underneath that, the really good workers and everything, although they might be more relevant and show up more often, aren't really given the credit they deserve. Actually, it just sounds like WWE. Well, uh, I thought anyway that the Laredo Kid could potentially somehow beat Kenny Omega and would therefore be the biggest babyface in AAA, not counting those few legends who show up once in a blue moon. Um, it didn't happen, but even though he lost, I still think he's probably the biggest babyface in AAA even just off the back of this performance. This was a fantastic match from Laredo Kid. He matched up with Kenny Omega so well. Generally, Omega matches up well with luchadors all the time. We've seen it with Phoenix in the past as well, for example. And I think a big part of that is the fact that Omega is often against these nimble high flyers, often the bigger guy. And when he's the bigger guy, especially in the role of a heel, he is devastating. His V triggers and everything, it all seems so devastating. And I think that could be a big part of it. On the other hand, Laredo Kid also just turned in a tremendous underdog performance. So that's why even though he lost, I'm pushing Laredo Kid up to number four this week. I thought he was absolutely superb. I wonder, because obviously he's been a bit cheeky on social media, there was a lot of speculation even before the match. I wonder if he's gonna head for pastures new in 2021. Because of course, people were kind of suggesting that this match was gonna be a great match even before it happened. Always a risk, but it delivered because, you know, it, it was really good on paper and it was going to be kind of hard to not deliver, I suppose, given the quality of the men involved. And because it seemed like it was going to be such a great match, people were saying after this match, Laredo Kid might get an offer from WWE. He might get an offer from AEW. I wonder what's happened since behind closed doors. I wonder if anything has happened yet or if something may happen in the near future. And if it does, I wonder where Laredo Kid is going to end up and I wonder what he's gonna do. But now we have to move on to his opponent and number three this week, and I believe, we'll find out for certain at the end, but I believe he's taken the lead as well in the league table because of this, Kenny Omega. Omega has had uh, an outstanding year, really, hasn't he? But over the course of 2020, we've seen the two sides of Kenny Omega. We've seen the tag wrestler, who nobody thought was gonna be in that good of a tag team with Hangman Page until they turned out to be incredible, but there were still the naysayers. There were still people saying, well, we wanna see Omega back in his New Japan mold. We wanna see the cleaner back. We wanna see him having these epic singles matches. This isn't where he belongs. I wasn't too concerned because I was loving what he was doing in the tag division, but I understood you know, that, that side of the argument. I understood that point of view. In the second half of the year though, we've seen 
actual Kenny Omega. And what I mean by that is, if you're unfamiliar with Omega back when he was like the best wrestler in the world for a time in New Japan, he can put on these epic quality matches. Everything that is said in his introduction on Dynamite every week is kind of true. He is that good when he sets his mind to it. And he recently has been setting his mind to it. He's been slowly getting back into the swing of things. I don't think we've seen peak top level Omega yet, but we saw an excellent match against Moxley. And now we've seen this in a very different way, this incredible match against Laredo Kid. Michael Nakazawa got involved, so only briefly, so it's fine. So it was a great match. It didn't just carry on Kenny Omega's insane heel run that he was on, and he was never really going to lose was he. Part of me wanted him to in a way, but he never really was. Uh, it also elevated his opponent. Omega did a great job in giving Laredo Kid a lot. He was very giving in this match, and both men emerged from it, I think, looking stronger. So a great performance by Omega this week. Fantastic stuff. Big week in the context of the league table too. This may have sealed the deal for Kenny Omega. Now let's get on to the top two. Number two this week, look at his cheeky wee face. He's so happy with himself. It's the 2020 best of the Super Juniors winner, Hiromu Takahashi. Takahashi has thrived in a very difficult year for New Japan. Him and Shingo, I'd say, have been the two shining lights of New Japan Pro Wrestling in a year when they haven't been able to put on that many shows, realistically. And Hiromu Takahashi has won, I believe, his second best of the Super Juniors tournament with this big week that he had. And I think it's fully deserved because honestly, since Kushida left, even though the quality has been there in the juniors division, no question about it, I feel like the star power in New Japan's juniors division hasn't quite been on the level that it maybe could be. So I guess to remedy that, you need to kind of get the belt back on a big name. Takashi is the ace now of the juniors division, the biggest star in the juniors division unquestionably. And I think that means that he's gonna win the belt on the second night of Wrestle Kingdom, beating El Fantasmo on night one and then beating Taiji Ishimori on night two. But to earn this privilege, to earn those matches, he had to overcome El Desperado this week in the tournament final, capping off a tournament where really there were a lot of good matches, but I feel like Takahashi was probably the most consistent performer night in and night out. Uh, it was a sensible decision to have him win the tournament and an easy one as well, I dare say, but it was the correct one too. Or was it? Um, before I explore that, congratulations to Hiromi Takashi, nine points in the bag for you, number two this week, fantastic stuff. Now on to number one, El Desperado. Number one this week is El Desperado, and well, he's had the match of his career this week. Um, the best match I've certainly ever seen him in, possibly the best match he's ever had, on both a work rate level and an emotional storytelling level too, and he lost. Desperado got to the final, and I was thinking, could they do it? Could they, could they have Desperado get the win here and win the whole tournament? They didn't quite do that, but in having him come so close and then lose, they may have even done him better in terms of booking and momentum than if he'd won the thing. I'll, I'll try and explain what I mean. Because the manner Desperado lost in could turn him into an absolute hero. We'll have to wait a little bit, I guess, to see the full effects of the storytelling in play. But in case you missed it, the key part of this match, after tearing each other limb from limb, Desperado was kind of down and out on the canvas. Takashi stood over him and in a fit of rage because Desperado had been healing it up quite a bit. Uh, he just ripped off the whole upper portion of his mask. So Desperado only had kind of this bit left and the referee kind of got Takashi off. He was like, stop, stop, stop. Desperado got up and just willingly took off the rest of his mask, threw it away and just battered Takahashi. The crowd obviously went crazy. This was awesome. I've never really heard a crowd get behind a heel so much in New Japan as they did here. And, and from that moment on, it was anyone's game. I thought for certain watching this, like Desperado's got to win now after that. He didn't, Takashi still won. But I feel like there's, there's more of the story that's yet to be told. And then you dig into the history of it and you realize that they also came up in the same class as Young Lions in New Japan. And I believe that Desperado may have even had his first New Japan match as a Young Lion against Takahashi and lost then as well. So if Takashi goes on to win the belt, could we see Desperado come through and challenge him and maybe win the damn thing in 2021, perhaps? Would he be a heel if he did so? I don't really know, because that would be almost too heroic of a story, especially with the ditching of the mask and everything. I don't really know if that would be the case. But regardless, a massive week for El Desperado. Congratulations to him. For the first time ever, he is my wrestler of the week. And now without any further ado, let's take a look at the penultimate league table. So with one week left to go, we see that Kenny Omega has taken an eight point lead over John Moxley in second place. Moxley's gonna have to have a huge last week of the year and I don't even think he's 
potentially going to wrestle. So Kenny Omega might have this thing sewn up. Uh, Cody Rhodes, Shingo Takagi, and Hiromu Takahashi, of course, have all kind of fallen in line behind him. But this could well be Omega's year. It, it looks like it at the moment, unless Moxley does something insane. As we move further down, we see the likes of Hangman Page, of course, Sammy Guevara, people who could have a massive 2021. Darby Allen there, of course, as well, rounding out the top 20 for now. But it's all still up in the air. And that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from Cardaholic.com. Leave your thoughts and opinions and match recommendations too in the comments section down below. Stay safe out there, stay positive, and I'll see you very soon.